Hey everyone, Wayne Fox here. Thanks for checking out the video. Uh, winter finally hit here in Utah, and I guess uh, from what I understand, most of the country is in pretty bad shape as far as the cold. I have a brother-in-law in Texas who's having to shovel snow. Uh, so I hope everybody's doing well out there. My beard's getting a little more longer, but I'm not around any people. I don't know what <laughs> people think of it. I guess I really don't care. Uh, I haven't decided whether I like it or not yet, but uh, we'll give it a little more time, see what comes out. Anyway, I thought I'd do a video about the I Want to Splay Studio, make sure that uh, I did one about two weeks ago, and I, I think I needed to clarify a few things, a couple comments, and I wanted to make sure that people that didn't read the comments, uh, I needed to cover that in the video. And also, I've learned since then a couple things that make me even less likely to recommend this, uh, specifically in its ability to make a high quality profile. Let's talk for a second about the device. The iWin Display Studio, from what I understand, is the Color Monkey hardware packaged up in the iWin Display package of all of X-Rite's other devices. They make several devices for display calibration. iWin Display Studio, iWin Display Pro, iWin Display Pro Plus. I think there's two or three versions of iWin Display Pro, depending on when you buy it. It improved over the years. I think there's a version one, two, and three. I'm not positive on that but I haven't seen one referred to as a three before. Uh, I assume that the electronics get better. That's why they're more expensive. I do know that the devices operate faster. For example, this operates at about half the speed of the i1 Display Pro. So if you're reading 100 patches or 120 patches, that's gonna take you you know, four or five minutes, whereas with i1 Display Pro it would take you maybe three minutes or two and a half to three minutes. Now that's not a big deal, I know, because we're only doing that every few months, most likely at the most, maybe once a month. But it's just a comment. I think there are other electronic differences in the way it reads color. And I've got a pretty graphic example of that at the end of the video that really shows you how much better profile can be made with an i1 Display Pro and i1 Profiler than you can make with this package. So let me quickly review what we're trying to do. I'm not gonna go into this in depth. If you haven't watched my seven part series, I encourage you to watch that because if you really want to understand where I'm coming from, you need to kind of get a full background here. So the first thing we're going to do is characterize the device. We're going to create a profile which describes its full capabilities. We're not going to put any artificial limit on it whatsoever because we understand the color management system is going to take our image data and map it into whatever the output space is, be it our display, our printer, a book, whatever, and maximize that output space's capabilities and the Visually, they're going to all be very similar to each other. They're going to be, they're going to look great. You don't have to worry about it. So we're going to trust the color management system to do that. And to do that, we create this profile with no artificial limits. We're not going to tell it to do sRGB or any of that stuff because we just want to know the maximum colors it can show. So second, we're going to calibrate the luminance of the display, which that means is we're going to adjust the brightness until what we see in our display matches the print in our viewing area. It's important we have an area to evaluate the work that's consistent with high quality light. My fifth video talks about that. I'll link it up in the corner. And if you don't have that, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. But one challenge I see a lot of photographers have is that they feel their prints are always a little too dark. And that's typically because your display is so bright that you're uh, lowering and increasing the density of your file to make it look good, otherwise it looks washed out. And be, that, that doesn't match your printer, that's where the disconnect is. And the only way to fix that is to adjust the brightness of your display until it visually matches. Now I suppose you could just dump way more light onto it if you wanted. I mean, if you really want to, you could just blast the print with so much light that it would match, but that's a really a natural condition and you certainly don't wanna do that. Now the last step is to calibrate the white point and it's basically the same thing. We're gonna change the white point until visually what we see on our display matches our viewing area. And viewing areas come, you know, there's a lot of choices and those are all personal choices and we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. But even if you buy D65 lights and you do D65 display value, I think you're gonna find that you, you're you gonna to wanna to probably change it one or 200K because you know D65 is sort of a theoretical and I've seen D65 lights that are quite a bit different than each other. So we really wanna calibrate that white point. And most of the time you're probably not using D65 to evaluate your work, which is a, a very unnatural state. And we'll talk about that more in a minute as well. Okay, so let's load up the software i1 uh, Display Studio. We'll just go through it really quickly. Let's see. And 
There it is. Uh, here you can see you can use a color monkey if you have one. Uh, if you have a color monkey, you can download the software and the licenses within the device. I think it'll work fine. Let's just go into the problems. If we go to display, uh, we want to make sure we select the correct display. For some reason, this always messes up and we really don't need it. Uh, if you notice that the default for photo is uh, Illuminate D65, and I'm not sure why this D65 standard has sort of been thrust upon the photographic world. I'm not sure why a color of light that's probably bluer than even most natural daylight, from what I understand, noonday sun is about 5,800K, uh, has been thrust upon us. And I do know that when I'm making prints, they're usually not viewed in an area that has D65 light. Even most homes now, even if they're putting LEDs in, are not putting in daylight LEDs anymore. They're putting in something that's a little warmer than that. We've just learned that that blue of light is really unpleasant. Uh, even Apple now has a thing where at evening it'll warm up your display a little bit because it's supposedly it, uh, that much blue light makes you not sleep well. So anyway, I don't want to use that. Now, if you want to use D65 lights, I still think you're going to have to tweak it a little bit. Uh, that was the comment that I had by one viewer, but I think the software should allow me to make a choice, and it's my personal preference. If you want to use D65, go ahead. I highly recommend you use something a little warmer. I've been in the printing industry. I started my color lab in 1976, and so I've been building evaluation stations with different lighting for a long, long time, and I found out that anytime your light is pure daylight, you tend to make things a little too warm which look fine until you get them into a situation where the light's actually a little warm, and then flesh tones can start looking muddy real quick. And I would rather have a situation where I'm evaluating you with a little bit more normal light. My personal choice, I use Lumacrest uh, 3000K bulbs, which are really more about 3600K. Now that sounds really warm, but understand a match on my display is only gonna be 5800K, not that far from D65. But the key here is if I go to custom, I cannot choose any of those points. I can go to D55 and watch how far that jumps. I can go to D50, which is the printing industry standard. And that's interesting that the printing industry, which is kind of similar to making photographs, is stuck down there. And I'm not sure how as the, all these companies that are doing things for photographers got stuck on D65. I can go to D75. I don't know who would use that. The problem with native is I don't know what native is, right? I have no clue. But notice I can't select a color temperature. Now, I don't know if there's a D60 standard aluminum or not. A D60 would be similar to 6000K. If they would just allow me to go halfway between these two, I think it might be close enough for most photographers. Almost all the displays that I've helped people calibrate, uh, despite what their viewing area is, have been between 58 maybe 57 once in a while up to 61 and 6,000 is going to be in the ballpark close enough that most photographers would be pretty happy. Now, personally, I want to nail it perfect. I've got my NEC display actually set at 5750 because I thought 5,800 was just not quite there, but you know, I, maybe I'm too picky on that, but that's one of the problems I have with the software is that it won't let me choose any white point that I want. And I really think that if I wanna use my display, I should have that capability. Uh, but I'm gonna be honest, that's really not the worst part of the software. The main reason I wanna not recommend it is because it doesn't make a great profile. So let's talk about the other problems. If we go to the next screen, uh, let's first of all talk about the limitations of the type of profile that it will make. Uh, this will only allow me to make a matrix-based profile. Matrix-based profiles are very small, and compared to a lookup table-based profile, which is also small by today's standards, uh, it's very small. As an example, let me just quickly show you here. This is the matrix-based profile that I made, which is only 9 kilobytes, and the lookup table-based profile is 1.3 megabytes made with i1 profiler. Now, a long time ago, that was kind of a big deal because megabytes were, you know, kind of like we feel about gigabytes today, right? But nowadays with modern computer speed and with the storage capabilities we have, I don't think it's a factor anymore. And the problem I have is that a lookup table-based profile is going to give me, I believe, a much higher quality profile on a lower end, more budget display or an older display. 
And to kind of give you an example of that, let me just show you if I, uh, this is a image of the patch that I've read. And you'll notice here, notice how much warmer these tones are. The top tone is the color that was being uh, sent to the display. And the bottom color is the, the color that the device read and look at look at the difference between some of these colors now i don't know how well they'll show up on your phone or anything like that i know it's really small but some of these uh, differences are pretty dramatic and so with a matrix based profile we're really creating back a three by three matrix nine points and we're going to triangulate all of the in-between colors in reference to any uh, a subset of those nine points and if you have a really high quality display that is perfectly linear, that actually works just fine. Most displays aren't that perfectly linear. A lookup table really creates a lookup table with an extensive number of points, and it will find the nearest points to the color it's wanting, and it will map the color based on those points, which because I now have this large amount of points, I can be much more precise in trying to make sure that when I'm mapping these colors, so in other words, I've got to map this color to this color. Well, what if it's a little bit different? So I think a lookup table based profile is something you really want to do. I don't think there's any reason not to do it anymore. And it won't let me do that. It only lets me make a matrix profile. It doesn't even tell me that. Um, I don't think the calibration matrix has anything to do with it. But once you make a profile and you realize it's only nine kilobytes, then you know it's definitely not a lookup table. One other issue I have is if you're making a lookup table based profile, you really want to measure a lot of colors. That's one of the reasons that is can be so much better as you just have a lot more data and this is this patch set i'm limited to i can only use a small patch set probably good enough for a matrix profile but with i1 uh, profiler i can measure about four times as many patches and get a much more refined much more precise profile if i use the large patch set let's last talk about the real problem so what i did is i made a profile using this and then i made a profile with my i1 display pro using I1 Profiler. And I'm just gonna show you those two profiles. This is a program called ColorThink. And over here, you'll see that the profile that I made with I1 Display Pro, I have a gamut volume of 971,000. All right, it's a 16-bit lookup table. The one I made with the I1 Display Studio is matrix-based. And it only has a gamut volume of 912,000. These are the same two, this is the same device, same display. And yet I have a gamut volume that's 10 to 12% bigger. If you wanna look at over here, the white line are the colors that I'm going to be able to use if I'm using the lookup table based profile. And look at how far, how far all these colors, I can, my display can show them. I can use those colors but not if I use the profile made with i1 Display Studio. And to me, that uh, is the biggest reason. I just think I get a better profile out of i1 Display Pro. I don't know if this is a limitation of the hardware or the software, but I do know that I think it's worth the extra money to buy an i1 Display Pro. Now, I will make one other comment. You can use this device with, I1, uh, with a product called Display Cal. Now, Display Cal is a open source software package, which is a front end to a very advanced color management system called Argyle CMS. And it's not too hard to use, but it's definitely more difficult than using iWin Profiler. And what I'm going to do is research that a little more. I've never used it because I've always been happy with iWin Profiler. But what I want to find out is, is that the limitation of iWin Display Studio software. And so if I use this with Display Cal, can I get a profile? that's as good or maybe even better than I can with uh, i1 Profiler and the i1 Display Pro? I don't know. And I will be working on that and as soon as I find out. But in the meantime, uh, still a thumbs down on this. I won't put a link in the description below. I will put a link to an i1 Display Pro and I really think it's worth a little bit of extra money to, to get a higher quality profile. Does it make a difference? I can't answer that question. All I know is I'm gonna get the best I can in your pursuit of trying to get great photographic prints, you don't want to hamper yourself with a display that's kind of limiting what it can show. It's just like a printer where you don't want to use a really lousy printer profile that doesn't actually take advantage of all the printer's capabilities or map it into sRGB, which will 
chunk off 20 to 25 percent of what the printer can show anyway well, thanks for watching the video uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel down there so when i get that other one out i've also got a few videos coming out about some of my uh archiving memory series i've got two or three of those that are in the works and i should have those pretty soon if you've been following any of those hope you find those interesting too hey thanks for watching hey see ya